Uh, today, inshallah ta'ala, we'll do another mini episode in history. As you know, I personally um, love history. I love to read books of history. And I find that history is one of the most neglected fields when we talk about Islam. And when we study history, there's so many benefits. And one of the main benefits is that it saves you from a naive idealism. You learn from the lessons of history and you form a sense of wisdom about how the world works. Today, inshallah, we're going to discuss a historical figure whose name has become well known to almost all Muslims who even know the basics of early Islamic history. And the personality is not one who is admired, rather he is one who is looked down upon. Yet he is also legendary, and that is the governor and the military leader by the name of Al-Hajjaj ibn Yusuf. Al-Hajjaj ibn Yusuf al-Thaqafi. This is a name whose very mention used to bring fear amongst so many people. Throughout the last 14 centuries of our Islamic history, hardly any governor or leader has been despised more than him. In fact, he was never the Khalifa, he was a governor. And he was a military commander. And yet still, to this day, when his name is mentioned, people frown, people scowl, and they have negative feelings. That's his impact. Yet still, he did some good as well. So I want to briefly summarize. Obviously, there's only so much you can do as usual in a short khatira. But again, the purpose of these khatiras is to pique our curiosity, to at least give us tidbits so that inshallah you can explore further, so that you have some paradigm within which to explore more information. Who is this person, Hajjaj ibn Yusuf, and why is his legacy so negative? What did he do? Hajjaj ibn Yusuf was born around 40 Hijrah. So he never saw the process. He's not a Sahabi. He is a, uh, of the next generation. He's not called the Tabi'i, even though technically he is, but he wasn't associated with knowledge. By the way, his grandfather was the first convert of Ta'if. He's from Ta'if, Thaqafi, Thaqif. He's from Ta'if. His grandfather, Urwa ibn Mas'ud, was the first convert of the people of Ta'if. And he was the one who negotiated or attempted to negotiate the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. His grandfather was the one who visited the Prophet ﷺ and then went back to the Quraysh and said, I have visited the emperors of Persia and Rome and I have not seen any group of people who admire their leader more than the Sahaba admire the Prophet ﷺ. That's Hajjaj's grandfather, right? So Hajjaj was born in a family that was prestigious and knowledgeable. This is what helped boost him later on. In those days, family meant everything. In those days, your credibility came from your lineage. He was born in a somewhat known lineage. His father, Yusuf, Hajjaj ibn Yusuf, was actually a Quran teacher in the city of Ibn Abbas. Think about that. When Ibn Abbas was alive, one of the Quran teachers in that city of Ta'if was Hajjaj's father. So Hajjaj is raised in a household of ilm and he became as a youngster the Quran teacher's assistant. And he used to help the students memorize, studied fiqh and subhanAllah, interestingly enough, his life was to take a sharp left turn but forever and ever he loved the Quran till he died. Amazing. He has a very negative legacy but one thing even his critics acknowledged, he loved the Quran. And he would recite the Qur'an. And he was associated with the Qur'an till he died, subhanAllah. Because his father was a Qur'an teacher. And he was raised in the environment of the Qur'an. So he decided he doesn't want to do this. He doesn't want to go down the religious route. So he went from Ta'if to the land of opportunity. Not America, Damascus. Damascus. Damascus was the capital. Damascus was the capital, the Umayyads. And he decided he wants to be powerful. He wants to have the prestigious life. And he started from the bottom. Where did he start from? He became a shurti. What is a shurti? Who can the Arabs tell me what is a shurti? Police. Police. police? Who was the shurat back then? Was it police? Hayya Sheikh, was it police? It was a conglomeration of the CIA, the FBI, and the police. You had the thugs and you had the anti-mafia along with the mafia, right? You had the government thugs. That's who the shurta were back then, right? It's basically whatever the government wants, who are they going to get to enforce it? It's called the shurat. The shurat becomes shurti, which is now you say modern police. Don't think of shurat, shurti, yani, uh, honorable position. No, 
these are government thugs. Whatever the military, whatever the, the government wants, this is the military branch. He starts as a bottom officer because he doesn't have any connections. And within five years, his ruthlessness and his harshness earns him respect in that group. And he starts raising up the ranks until he becomes in charge of the unit. And he was a strict disciplinarian from back in the day. If anybody disobeyed, the harshest punishment. Until finally, long story short, he raises his ranks until the Khalifa, Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, hears of his loyalty and ruthlessness. And he appoints him the head officer of the Shurat. He becomes the chief FBI, CIA police inspector, i.e., the military branch. He is the, the, the military governor, basically, right? Or the military general. The internal military, not the external. So you have the internal that's going to be for your own citizens. That's what he was in charge of. This is the reputation when he's still in his 20s. He's still in his 20s. And one of the things about him from the beginning was his brutality. It is said he would kill people like we drink tea. He didn't care about killing as if it was something sacred. To him, taking a life was no big deal. From the beginning, he was like this. SubhanAllah, very interestingly, he was not known to drink or gamble or womanize. And he used to recite the Quran. Yet still, he was a mass murderer for the government. Ajib, these, the, those eras, they have some very interesting people. And Hajjaj is one of them. So, Hajjaj became known for his ruthlessness and his loyalty to the Umayyads. Now, if you know what's happening at this time, you're going to have to mention a lot of history here. One of the biggest problems of the Umayyad dynasty at this time was Abdullah ibn Zubair. Abdullah ibn Zubair had his own mini caliphate. He had broken away in Mecca and Medina, and he was independent for a few decades. Hajjaj convinced Abdul Malik ibn Marwan to send him as the, the chieftain of the army against Hajjaj, against Ibn Zubair. From being the local domestic police officer, he said, give him to me. I will take charge. This is going to be an upgrade, which is going to be another upgrade. This is how he's doing this. And so, Abdul Malik Ibn Marwan risks sending this person to deal with somebody who for 20 years has been a thorn in the side of the Umayyads, right? He has not been able to be conquered by the Umayyads. Hajjaj says, give him to me. I'll deal with him. And subhanallah, this is when his ruthlessness now becomes, I shouldn't say legendary. I should, what's the opposite of legendary? It becomes the most, it, it begins now. Where is, Abdul, where is Abdullah ibn Zubair? In Mecca. In Mecca. Why has it been difficult to capture and conquer him? Because he's in Mecca. What are you going to do? Attack the Kaaba? That's exactly what Hajjaj ibn Yusuf did. No conscience. He surrounded the city of Mecca for six months, cut off every supply. Now, Mecca is not like Medina. Are there fruit palms, date palms? Are there, is there greenery in Mecca? No. Mecca, you need supplies to come in. And Mecca has hujjaj, innocent people. Mecca has mu'tamireen. Mecca has, I mean, Allah says, man dakhalahu kana amina, right? Allah has called Mecca the haram. Ibrahim, alayhi salam, made Mecca the haram. Hajjaj couldn't care less. He surrounded Mecca while there were Hajjaj inside. Can you believe? For six months, cut off the city from all supplies of water and, so, and food. Now water, they had zamzam, but still it's not enough for the whole city. And they have no food until finally people began eating animals on the streets. It was one of the worst disasters to hit Mecca during that time frame. And Hajjaj then offered amnesty to everybody who abdicated and left Abdullah ibn Zubair. Amnesty, I'll forgive you. Come over to my side. I'll give you money. You will be a person of honor and you will get food. Now you tell me, how long will people like this last? Your wife and children are dying. How long will this last, right? To make matters worse, and this is again unbelievable, he attacked Mecca with catapults. He set up catapults outside the city and trying to kill Abdullah ibn Zubayr and the people and he destroyed the Kaaba. This is the level of depravity of Hajjaj ibn Yusuf. A Muslim attacking the city of Mecca for the sake of money and power, for the sake of loyalty to the 
Umayyads. No other person would go to that level. That's why Ibn Zubayr was safe. But Hajjaj couldn't care less. And the Kaaba was destroyed. Now, pause here, footnote. Abdullah ibn Zubayr had reconstructed the Kaaba like a rectangle. The original structure of Ibrahim alayhi salam. And it was like a rectangle for around 20 years. Hajjaj destroyed it. Eventually, he's going to enter the city. And he rebuilds it like a square. And it has remained a square. So for, since the time of the process and up until now, only for around 15, 20 years, the Kaaba was the original structure in the time of Ibn Zubayr. Hajjaj destroyed it. Because of Hajjaj, it is now back in the original structure that it was. In any case, so after six months, the majority of Ibn Zubayr's people um, uh, abandoned him. And this very, was very painful for Ibn Zubayr. And we feel for the both sides, like the, the people who abandoned, we understand. Ibn Zubayr felt completely betrayed. These were his loyal followers for decades. But you have to survive. Food, water, your children. What's going to happen? Slowly but surely, Ibn Zubayr sees people leaving en masse. Ibn Zubayr goes to his mother. Who's his mother? Asma binti Abi Bakr. Ibn Zubayr has a whole qissa and story. His mother is Asma. Asma, the older sister of Aisha, right? And he says, Ya Ummah, should I surrender to Hajjaj? Asma is 100 years old. 100 years old. She's still alive. Blind. Eyesight gone. But her memory and mind is just as sharp as it was. She said to him, Were you fighting for money and power or were you fighting for the sake of Allah? He said, For the sake of Allah. So she says, So you're going to give up when you have no money and power? You're going to give up now? Fight to the end. What is he going to do to you? Give you the death of a shaheed? Go for it. His mother gave him the blessings. And so when he heard this, he kissed his mother farewell. And whoever was remaining, he then marched. And he was brutally massacred by Hajjaj. His body was hung on a cro cross. And by a cross, we don't mean like an X cross, but like a, uh, a cross is also a straight cross. It's a post, a peg. His body was hung on a peg outside of the Kaaba for weeks until it was rotting to give people the image that this is who we are. Don't you dare do Ibn Zubayr. This is Hajjaj. Until Ibn Abbas begged Hajjaj for the love of Allah, please bury the body. Right? This was Hajjaj. Hajjaj, when he entered the city, he said, bring that al the, um, uh, the one of the two belts, uh, Asma, bring her to me. And the, 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 the servant went to Asma. Asma said, Wallahi, I'm never going to go to him. I don't care. He's not going to go to him. So he said to the person, if she doesn't come, I'm going to drag her by her hair. I'm going to drag her to my palace, to my office by her hair. The, 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 the servant went and said this threat. She said, I challenge him. Go get somebody to drag me by my hair. I'm not going to come. When the servant came back, so Hajjaj then walked to the house of Asma to taunt her. Can you believe the depravity? He's just killed her son, right? To taunt her. It's a famous episode in history. And he says, what do you think of what I did to the enemy of Allah, meaning her son? Meaning he's just taunting her. She said, I see that you have finished his dunya by finishing your akhirah. Powerful. You have taken his dunya, so what? But you have taken your own akhirah. This hadith is in Sahih Muslim, by the way. Then she said, I have heard the Prophet predict that there shall be a mass murderer from the tribe of Thaqif. And I am certain that it is you. This hadith is in Sahih Muslim. I heard the Prophet say there's going to be a mubir. Mubir, somebody who causes chaos and mayhem. He kills and kills and kills. I heard the Prophet say there's going to be a mubir from the tribe of Thaqif. And I am certain that that one is you. And she made dua against Hajjaj, and she then died yani, uh, you know, of old age. She, Hajjaj did not uh, kill her. This is Hajjaj. Abdullah ibn Warman made him the governor of Mecca and Medina as a gift. Now he's rising up in ranks, right? First it was the Shurat, then the chieftain of the Shurat, then the army. Now he becomes the governor, which is what he wanted. And he becomes the governor in Medina. In Medina. When the sons of the Sahaba and some of the Sahaba are still alive. By the way, Hajjaj met the Sahaba. Again, this is now 60, 70 Hijra, 72 Hijra. 72 Hijra, you had some of the younger Sahaba. Anas ibn Malik, right? You had um, uh, Ibn Umar was still alive. He met Ibn Umar, Ibn Abbas. He, he knows these Sahaba. He has seen them. And he becomes the governor in 
Medina. And this is where we have a whole host of a hadith in Bukhari and Muslim about the complaints that the sons of the Sahaba had against, against uh, Hajjaj. He would delay the salah. He was lazy when it came to praying on time. Now back in the day, the governor was the one who re- led the salah and the Jumu'ah and the Eid. Okay? Back in the day, it was understood that the governor must be the one in charge of the main masjid and the khutbah and the, and the uh, uh, Eid and whatnot. And obviously, Hajjaj is not somebody who's going to be giving good khutbahs and whatnot, right? Thank Allah we don't have this issue anymore. Can you imagine the kings and princes if they had to give the Eid khutbah? Can you imagine? Anyway, okay, let me not get banned from other countries. The point is that Hajjaj was a disaster. And the sons of the Sahaba and the righteous people of Medina, they began to complain so much about his zulm, his tyranny, about the fact that he's not praying properly, he's not praying on time, until finally Abdul Malik had no choice but to withdraw him from the governorship of Mecca and Medina. But then he said, I'm going to send you to your biggest test, Iraq. Now, pause here. A lot of people don't know this, especially if you haven't studied history. Iraq was always problematic for the Umayyads. Iraq is where so many fitan happened, all the resurrections happened, you know, the, uh, the tashayyur happened in Iraq, right? All of, the re- all of this stuff happened in Iraq. Why this is the case beyond the scope of this class? Iraq was always problematic for the Umayyads. Abdul Malik Ibn one one said, this is your gift. If you get Iraq, you will be, I'm not going to ask any questions. Your salary, because remember, governors back then, you're basically a mini king. You only have to report to the Khalifa, that's it. As long as he said, you get Iraq under my control, no questions asked. So Abdul Malik then, sorry, Hajjaj then went to Iraq. And he entered the Grand Masjid of Basra. And he gave a speech that is legendary. It's found in the books of Hadith and it's found in the books of history. He gathered all of the leaders of the insurrections, the resurrections, the khawarij, the tashayyu, everybody. And he looked around and he said, I see most of these heads will have them chopped off from the necks that they're on in a little while. This is the first word that comes from his mouth when he enters the masjid. I look around me and I see blood dripping everywhere. He asked them, the governor before me, what did you do when, when you disobeyed? They said, he would whip us. He would put us in jail. He said, as for me, I don't know whips, I don't know jails, I only know the sword. That's all I know. There will be no jails, there will be no whips, there will be no fines. I only know the sword. O people of Iraq, if I tell you to exit from that door, and I see you exit from that one, your blood is halal in my eyes. And guess what? That's exactly what he did. Unbelievable. He got Iraq in his control by being the brutal dictator that he eventually became. He fought every insurrection. He did just the level of brutality. And because of this, the Umayyads gave him carte blanche authority. This was the reality of who Hajjaj was. In his lifetime, the most disastrous revolt against the Umayyads took place in Iraq. It is known as the revolt of Ibn al-Ash'ath. I have given a library chat where I mentioned this in a little bit more detail. Ibn al-Ash'ath was Hajjaj's own military commander. He sent Ibn al-Ash'ath to a land, the, the Turks. Ibn al-Ash'ath had a very large army. He, he was conquered. I mean, he, he was conquerous. He was victorious. And the army was grumbling about Hajjaj top to bottom. Ibn al-Ash'ath had delusions of grandeur. If this whole army is under me, and they don't like Hajjaj, maybe I can revolt against Hajjaj. You see what's happening here? Ibn al-Ash'ad said to the army, what would you say if we return back to Iraq and fight Hajjaj and I become your leader? They said, you are better than Hajjaj for sure. Bismillah, let's go for it. This became known as the revolt of Ibn al-Ash'ad. Now the reason why this revolt was different was for many reasons. First and foremost, this is the internal military, coup d'etat, attempt of coup d'etat. This is the Umayyad army. Secondly, theologically, these are not Mu'tazila, Khawarij, Tashayyu'. These are the same people. Thirdly, this is the key point. Ibn al-Ash'ath, because he was from Basra, Kufa, because he was from Iraq, 
the people of Iraq knew him and loved him. So the scholars of Basra supported him, including people like Anas ibn Malik, the Sahabi. Even though he didn't join, he was 98 years old, he kind of like gave tacit support. His own children, grandchildren were in there. And many of the scholars, that's why this revolt was called the revolt of the scholars. Because this was the first time many ulama, students of Ibn Abbas, most famously, <coughs> Sa'id ibn Jubayr. One of the most famous students of Ibn Abbas, Sa'id ibn Jubayr. <coughs> Excuse me, my voice is <coughs> still sore. So Ibn al-Ash'ath was successful for two years, carved out a mini state, but then Hajjaj destroyed the army and massacred all of the Qurra and Ulama, literally no mercy. And this caused a massive, you know, uh, sense of fear and whatnot, paranoia, things happen. And Ibn al-Ash'ath fled for his life. When he was captured, he committed suicide rather than be turned over to Hajjaj. He literally you know, he was taken prisoner. He literally broke himself free and jumped off a cliff because he knew if I get back to Hajjaj, I mean, I'm not justifying, I'm saying in his mind, he knew if I get back to Hajjaj, what's going to happen? He literally committed suicide on the way back as a prisoner. And so many ulama and qura were killed. In the revolt, in the time of Ibn al-Ash'ath's revolt, Anas ibn Malik, was seen by Hajjaj ibn Yusuf. Anas ibn Malik, the Khadim of the Prophet Anas ibn Malik is now 95 years old, 90 years old. And Hajjaj says to him, Unais, Unais is making fun of his name, little Anas, Unais, have you no shame? When you were younger, you were with Ibn al-Zubayr. Now you're older, you go to Ibn al-Ash'ath. Before this, you were on the side of Ali. By the way, uh, Al-Hajjaj was very anti-Ali radiallahu anhu. He was pro-Umawi, anti-anti-Ali. And he would, a'udhu billah, curse and whatnot. Uh, Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu. So he says to Anas, makes fun of him. Have you no sense? You're with Ali, then you're with Ibn Zubayr, then you're with Ibn Al-Ash'ath. Wallahi, if I had my way with you, you would see how I deal with traitors like you. Anas ibn Malik was shocked. He said, you are speaking to me like this? He said, yes, you. In public, in front of everybody. Anas wrote a letter to Abdul Malik ibn Marwan. And he said, Your governor humiliated me in public and spoke to me in a manner that I'm not worthy to be spoken to. And I am a servant of the Prophet. ﷺ. So you do something or else. Abdul Malik ibn Marwan wrote a letter to Hajjaj. It's the only time, the only time that. Hajjaj was rebuked by Abdul Malik. And it was, it's a long letter, it's preserved in the books of history. He said, oh Hajjaj, your aql is getting too big for you. Your ego is getting too big for you. Either you apologize and make up to Anas ibn Malik, or I will put you in your place. Had any servant of Isa ibn Maryam been seen by the Christians, they would have massaged his feet. Had any servant of Moses been alive and the Jews saw him, they would have elevated, put on a pedestal. How dare you treat the Khadim of the Prophet in this manner? Go and apologize now and make up to him or else I shall deal with you directly. Never had Hajjaj been spoken to in this manner. It is said when he got the letter, he stood up from his kursi and he walked to the house of Anas ibn Malik and begged him for forgiveness. Subhanallah. At least Abdul Malik had a little bit of iman to put Hajjaj in his place. Right? Subhanallah. In any case, long story short, these are some of the negatives. What are some of the positives? And yes, there are. This is the strange thing. There are some positives. Of the positives of Hajjaj ibn Yusuf, really strange, is that he loved the Quran so much that he played an instrumental role in making sure the codification of Uthman radiallahu an became universal. Long story, but Uthman radiallahu an, you know the Mus'haf of Uthman, yani not everybody handed in the alternative copies. Hajjaj made it a point. This is now going to be the universal qira'ah. And he spent money producing a better copy of the Mus'haf, Nuqat, Tashkil, calligraphy. This Hajjaj Ibn Yusuf is the first person to make a master copy that has calligraphy in it. Of the positives of Hajjaj, most of us here are from India and Pakistan. Hajjaj Ibn Yusuf, we owe much to him. You all know this. You all know this. What did Hajjaj Ibn Yusuf do? 
sent his not zamba kasra bhai sahab wo bhi kiya sahi baat hai sent his own cousin his own cousin who was his cousin muhammad ibn qasim athqafi his cousin ibn am literally his cousin he chose his cousin and sent him with an army to sindh and makran and this is how islam was established in our lands he loved to expand darul islam and he financed and he made sure they have the best armies he sent armies all the way to sindh to china the reason why the turkistan province is now muslim is because of hajjaj allah blessed us with that image of hajjaj yusuf he wanted islam to go there in his lifetime islam went from the far east to the far west and also in hind and and sindh this is hajjaj ibn yusuf al-thaqafi hajjaj also one of the things that he did he arabicized the bureaucracy in iraq and iran it was in persia it was in farsi it was in farsi he goes no the language of islam is arabic so he introduced arabic he had coinage made that is more arabic not fully is you know, there's still an interim i i have some of hajjaj's coin by the way hajjaj has an interesting modified coin from the sassanid empire which is islamicized that's hajjaj ibn yusuf he has that type of coin he has other positives as well how did he die hajjaj ibn yusuf passed away in the year 95 hijra what happened one of the greatest scholars in ibn al ash'ath's revolt was said ibn jubair the student of ibn abbas said ibn jubair one of the main students of ibn abbas When Ibn al-Ash'ath's revolt was massacred and killed, Sa'id ibn Jubayr fled for his life to Mecca. Eventually he was captured 10-15 years later and he was brought to Hajjaj. Now he's an elderly man, Sa'id ibn Jubayr. He was brought to Hajjaj. And Hajjaj mocked him and said, "I'm going to execute you right here and now." And he told the executioner to kill him it is said that he didn't even allow him to pray two rak'ah which is again it's the custom of the world back then even today when you're going to be executed the this government says what's your last meal what do you want you know get some perks right it's the custom of the world it is said it is said and according to some reports he did according to some reports, he didn't even allow that so said ibn jubair said ya allah i have one dua from you one dua ya allah let my life be the last life that hajjaj is able to take that's the last dua that said ibn jubair and in front of him said ibn jubair if you know said ibn jubair he is scholar of hadith qiraat quran tafsir this is allama the main sur ibn abbas right and hajjaj and this is 15 years after i mean come on okay even if you're angry come on forgive no he wants to get vengeance So Sayyid Ibn Jubayr said, "Ya Allah, the last life let it be mine, let him not take any life after mine." And subhanallah, soon as Sayyid Ibn Jubayr was killed, Hajjaj fell sick with the sickness, the doctors could not understand what it is. And his stomach began fermenting, he couldn't eat food, and within a few weeks the doctor said, "You're about to die." And he would say to himself, Woe to me and Saeed why did i kill Saeed woe to me and Saeed i wish i had left Saeed he understood the dua of Saeed worked against him and he passed away in that same year of 95 hijra uh, along with all of his interesting side uh, professions believe it or not he was an accomplished poet there's a lot of poetry of hajjaj they say hajjaj by the way they say and this is not what i'm saying these days is politically incorrect to say this but they say he was a short stocky ugly man don't look at me this is in every single book of history right uh, but he was charismatic in speech and he could command an audience and he was extremely eloquent and he was a poet and it is said on his deathbed this is the poetry that um, he said يا رب قد حلف الاعداء واجتهدوا بانني رجل من ساكني النار يحلفون على عمياء ويحهم ما علمهم بكريم العفو الغفار ذات يا رب the people are swearing the people are swearing and they're trying their best to make sure that this happens that i am from the people of jahannam يا رب the people are giving halaf and qasam and they're really trying to make me of the people of jahannam and all of this oath is in vain woe to them what do they know of how much karam al-afu and al-ghaffar has upon people he died with this subhanallah right so by the way like with this i conclude these days a lot of people when when a brutal dictator comes up what not they say oh, this is a modern hajjaj ibn yusuf i say no it is true 
that Hajjaj has a lot of evil. Imam al Dhahabi says he has some good, but they shall drown in the ocean of his evil. This is what Imam al Dhahabi says. He has some good, they shall drown in the ocean of his evil, and we leave his affair to Allah. This is what Imam al Dhahabi said. I say modern dictators and modern rulers, they also have oceans of evil, but they don't have a fraction of the good that Hajjaj does. <laughs> Hajjaj loved the Quran. And Hajjaj, whatever his sins were, whatever his sins were, weird way, it was loyalty to the Umayyads. Like, it, it is said that he would one year go for Hajj, one year go for Jihad, because he was eager in spreading Darul Islam. As I said, the Islamic empire spread under his time frame, interestingly. But it was just his loyalty to the Umayyads. I don't care if I have to kill people. And this couplet that he said on his deathbed, it shows that deep down inside, he did believe in Allah and he knew he had committed sins and he knew he's an evil person. And he said, Ya Rab, everybody is certain I'm going to go to Jahannam. And I swear they're all blind because they don't know how generous you are because you are the Ghafoor and the Rahman. This is what he died upon, subhanAllah. So we don't say anything good because really all the Sahaba and Tabi'un hated him that were alive at his time. But at the same time, we leave his affair to Allah and we thank the good that he has done and as for the evil in that, we live to the Day of Judgment. Inshallah, I hope that this is something that will open our minds to the reality of our history. And inshallah, we'll continue as usual with Allah Ta'ala in our future classes. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Inna al-Muslimina wal-Muslimati wal-Mu'minina wal-Mu'minati wal-Qanitina wal-Qanitati wal-Sadiqina wal-Sadiqati wal-Sabirina wal-Sabirati wal-Khashi'ina wal-Khashi'ati والخاشعين والخاشعات والمتصدقين والمتصدقات والصائمين والصائمات والحافظين فروجهم والحافظات والذاكرين الله كثيرا والذاكرات أعد الله لهم مغفرة وأجرا عظيما